All right. Um, hello and welcome everyone to this third event of the Canadian Electric School Bus Alliance's conference, Electrifying Canada's School Bus Fleet, Challenges, Lessons Learned and Solutions. My name is Brianna Salmon and I'm the Executive Director at Green Communities Canada. And I'll be your host for today's webinar on advocating for electric school bus adoption in key provinces. I want to start today by acknowledging the land where I'm fortunate to live. I'm joining from Ngojuanong, Peterborough, which is in Eastern Ontario. This is Michisaugig territory covered by T Treaty 20 and later by the Williams Treaties. These treaties continue to be contested with the courts recently overruling unjust limitations on Indigenous rights, including the right to hunt, fish and live freely on these lands. I want to acknowledge the Anishinaabeg people as the original and contemporary caretakers of this region. And I want each of us to take actions to honor the rights of Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island today and every day. Today's event includes a short introduction from the Canadian Electric School Bus Alliance, four presentations from leading researchers and advocates, and some concluding remarks. There will be a short discussion session after each presentation. If if you have any questions during the presentations, please write them in the questions tab, which is at the bottom right of your screen, and we'll share them aloud with the panelists. For anything else, comments, reactions, links, you can also use the chat function, which is just beside the questions function. Um, please note that the session is being recorded and that the recording will be made available after the event. The Canadian Electric School Bus Alliance, or CESBA for short, is a Canada-wide coalition of organizations from environmental NGOs and health associations to fleet operators and EV advocacy groups, all advocating for policies that accelerate school bus electrification. We aim to see all Canadian school bus fleets electrified by 2040 or sooner. To achieve this, we organize events such as this conference, to facilitate networking and knowledge sharing among stakeholders. And we work on developing strategies and recommendations to accelerate the uptake of ESBs at the federal and provincial levels of government, and especially in the provinces of PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia. For this event, we'll be discussing the advocacy efforts towards achieving a fully electric Canadian school bus fleet. We're joined today by speakers from New Brunswick, Nova Scotia and Ontario, including Elizabeth Gresh from Conservation Council of New Brunswick, Thomas Arneson McNeil from Ecology Action Centre, Mark Sally from Pollution Probe and Adam Thorne from Pembina Institute. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for joining us today. We're gonna get started with our first speaker, Elizabeth Gresh. Elizabeth has dedicated over 15 years of her career to advancing climate action through education, outreach and advocacy. Her academic background includes a master's in environmental studies, a diploma in business and, in, and the environment and a bachelor's degree in education and economics. As a mother of three, she's acutely aware of the impacts climate change can have on the physical and mental health of future generations. She understands that the choices we make today will shape our ability to tackle the challenges posed by a warming planet. Elizabeth is proud to call New Brunswick her home and is excited to work alongside the climate team at CCNB to drive change forward in her community. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Elizabeth who will get us started with the first presentation. Hi everybody. I'm cannot see the slides right now and I'm just wondering if the entire audience can't see the slides or if it's just me. Might just be you. Might just be me. <laughs> okay so I am going to just use my own slide and try to just move this along. Yeah, you can just let me know. I can move them forward on the screen for you. Okay that's great. Good. All right so Thank you very much for having me today. I'll just get right to it with the next slide. 
Um, just to give you a context of what's happening in New Brunswick. So we uh, currently have a fleet of 1,250 buses and growing, uh, which for some provinces might seem like a small fleet, but this is the largest percentage admitter in our entire government fleet. Um, and so I just like to mention that, that, uh, you know, some provinces have a lot more buses. That's the buses are the majority of our government fleet. So when we talk about greening the fleet, the buses are a big part of that. Uh, the buses uh, in our province run for about seven to 10 years. So every time we purchase a new uh, diesel bus, it locks in those emissions for a decade. So it's really important that uh, for our advocacy campaign that we really focus on addressing that, that we're locking this in for another decade. So what does that look like in 2033 and 2034? 20, 20, uh, 20, yeah, you know, we're actually kidding against some of these key climate targets uh, when we aren't purchasing today. Uh, and another bit of context, so all of our uh, purchasing is done through our Department of Education. Uh, and in 2021, when we started this work, we had two electric school buses. Uh, so our advocacy strategy uh, for the next slide, <laughs> sorry, I still can't see them. Um, it's really to know the why. So we started off by looking at why we were doing this work, why the Department of Education might be interested in this work and why other parents and key stakeholders might be interested in these buses and also why wouldn't they be interested in these buses uh, and those were really the big conversations that we were having at the table we are a nonprofit we're environmental we're about conservation but the department of education their mandate is really about student learning and and keeping kids safe and moving the education forward and a small part of that is getting them from home to school so we really needed to look at speaking their language and trying to find ways where we could connect our mission to their mission uh, to really focus on them getting dollars to uh, electrify the buses. So just moving to the next slide, um, we really focused on the idea that we, we thought, okay, what, what would really speak to our Department of Education? and we looked at children feeling sick and we thought about kids going to school and being exposed to diesel emissions has very strong evidence to support that there are links to asthma and bronchitis episodes every year in Canada. So we really drove that message forward that this wasn't just about the climate change mission, it was really about kids on buses and kids feeling sick because of diesel exhaust exposure. So we focused on that message to the Department of Education um, that kids are missing school um, because they're riding on diesel buses. Um, just moving forward, then we also looked at um, a report done by Pollution Probe that showcased um, some of the cognitive development issues around children and response times, ADHD, anxiety, and depression links to transportation-related transportation, transportation air pollution. Uh, so we really want to focus that this, they were in the business of getting diesel buses off the road if they're in the, if they're in the business of teaching and learning. Um, so we wanted to really keep that to connect the idea of learning to diesel exhaust exposure as part of the mission. Of, of our work to really draw on the attention from the Department of Education that makes the choice of what buses they're going to purchase. Um, just, um, I'm moving to the next slide, um, making smart choices for our children. Uh, we drew upon a study as well that was done in Georgia called School Bus Emissions Student Health and Academic Performance that showed that when diesel buses were um, when less diesel buses were around schools, there was a 30% uh, decrease in childhood bronchitis and asthma cases. So we wanted to show them that, you know, transportation related pollution might be cars, it might be buses, it might be all kinds of transportation, but this was a study done directly related to school buses. And we really wanted to show them that there was evidence to support 
um, the reduction of school buses linked to some of these health issues. The other benefits uh, on the next slide um, were really carbon renewal, removal, um, showing that they connect to the climate plan in New Brunswick, as well as uh, school bus driver safety. So um, the school bus drivers of our electric school buses and other school electric school buses really found them a lot quieter uh, and therefore felt like they could uh, they were safer to operate. So they could hear the kids at the back, they could hear kids around the buses. They felt that that was a really positive change from the loud diesel engine. So that would keep the union happy, which again was the business of the Department of Education. Um, the third piece was we really wanted to showcase to our government that changing the buses would be an amazing step forward and a visual step forward in showing New Brunswick's commitment to future generations and their commitment to fighting climate change. And we thought that was a great role for our Department of Education to play as a leader in, in this movement, um, that by changing the buses, this would be a, a signal across every community in our province that we are committed to climate action. Um, next slide just and another big piece of it was making sure it was feasible so working with the bureaucrats at the department of education we were in discussion is it actually feasible to deliver uh kids from home to school on electric school buses and right off the bat the department said like without doing a study just on the top of their heads that at least 60 percent of the routes at least 60% of the routes could be delivered. So that was a lot of buses. That's over 500 buses and we had two in the province. So we started to think, okay, this is something we need to address. It can be done right now. We don't need to change routes. We don't need to you know, think outside the bus. This is feasible from a route perspective as well. Um, so we wanted to make sure that that was, that was feasible before we went ahead to advocate. Um, and we heard it was, and, and the bureaucrats we were working with were just wonderful allies for us and on board with, with this movement as well. Um, another piece of our advocacy strategy was really focused on um, talking about the money piece of the school buses. <laughs> so just, uh, we have a conservative government right now in New Brunswick. They're very, very focused on reducing debt in the province. So when we brought up the fact that there is a, a federal fund called the Zero Emissions Transit Fund and that money was being left on the table, um, that was a cue for them to do stuff and to dedicate staffing resources to look into this Zero Emissions Transit Fund because it's something that we were missing out on in New Brunswick. In 2021, we had not applied to the Zero Emissions Transit Fund. We had not looked into it. And that was a cue for government to start looking into it and um, now actually moving forward with the feasibility study to start the application process. Um, so just what the province is doing. Uh, so in late 2022, they purchased 20 electric school buses. So this is a big win for our province. We got had 20 new line electric school buses come to the province and we had our government commit to a feasibility study with Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, which is underway. And it says October 2022 there, but it, I mean 2023. So it should be ready um, this fall. So those are two really positive steps. Um, some in the red on this slide, it's they also still purchased 90 diesel buses so when we first heard of the 20 electric school buses we thought great that means they'll purchase less less diesel buses but they actually purchased the same amount as they had intended to um, with their budget so we were a bit disappointed to see that the electric buses hadn't offset the purchase of diesel buses um, but that's hopefully to come with the feasibility study uh, going forward and we also have no formal commitment to electrify the school fleet over the long term yet. And that's something that we're working on in the province, really trying to encourage our government to create some sort of goal for 2030, for 2035, 
um, to uh, bring the fleet to fully electric or as electric as it can be based on our roots here in New Brunswick. Um, the feasibility study is really a missing piece of that. And when that's done, we hopefully can use that study to leverage um, the transition even faster. And, um, oh, this piece um, for the, from the Telegraph Journal. So in response to the uh, the 20 electric school bus purchase, we decided to create an op-ed in the newspaper, really just focusing on the fact that we were happy that the government bought 20 electric school buses. And we also were wondering why they purchased 90 diesel buses. So we wrote an op-ed kind of encouraging the public to question that and to ask the government why they were buying, continuing to buy diesel buses uh, to really draw in the social consciousness around the transition of the fleet. And lastly, in terms of our next steps, so uh, we're continuing to meet with key government stakeholders um, to achieve our formal commitment to electric school buses. Um, we're creating an education campaign for schools. So we've got 20 electric school buses coming and we want to build education around those buses at the schools that they're going to to um, get excitement from parents and from students. And we're going to be working with our parent school support committee. So every school in New Brunswick has a support committee um, to drive information sharing at the parent level. And we also are wanting to collect more data around PM 2.5, particular matter 2.5 with the New Brunswick Lung Association around school drop zones to really understand um, how high the PM 2.5 raises at drop times and pickup times with buses for um, air quality monitoring. Uh, and lastly, we're going to continue to work with the SESPA team, the national team to um, fight for the extension or advocate for the extension of the zero emissions transit fund so that our government feels confident that if they do commit to the transition that they would receive support at the federal level um, for the next so many years, hopefully more than I think it ends in 2025 or 2026. And that's it for me. I had 10 minutes. I think I <laughs> tried to stick to it as quick as, as closely as possible. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was really, really great presentation. Um, in between each presentation, we have about five minutes for questions. Um, so if you have any questions that you haven't yet put in the questions um, tab at the bottom right, you can add your questions and, and I'll read them aloud. Um, so we have one question in there so far. Um, and it's, um, do you know who's doing the feasibility study that you mentioned? Oh my goodness. I think Thomas actually from Ecology Action knows better than me. Yeah, I can just hop in to say, uh, so it's the, uh, there's one uh, organization that procures all school buses in Atlantic Canada, uh, particularly diesel school buses right now. It's called the Council of Atlantic Ministers of Education and Training. Uh, so it's Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, PEI, and Newfoundland. Uh, and so they've all partnered together to conduct this feasibility study. Uh, and that's part of the process of accessing federal funding under the Zero Emissions Transit Fund. Thank you very much, both of you, for that answer. Mm -hmm. um, a few other questions uh, while we're waiting to see if, if others have questions in the portal. Um, so you estimated that 60% of New Brunswick school bus routes could be delivered with an electric school bus in all weather conditions. Um, what could be done about the other 40%? Mm -hmm. and, and what's sort of the barrier that, that exists for that 40%? Yeah, so we when we met with the Department of Education, that was something that they estimated for us knowing that the route knowing the routes um for the longer routes it's really like that was the very very safe guess like that was very very safe so the hope is that with the feasibility study it'll be much higher than that but these are i think the buses are about 100 kilometers um 
between charging in all weather and our routes are much shorter than that in terms of what we can, what we do for students. We're not taking kids that far, um, but they did want to recognize that they didn't want to put any kids on an electric bus where the route was questioning and where we didn't have time to recharge in between, given that, you know, some of the drivers are doing two, three routes in a, in a row, given our drop times. So that was really a, a very safe estimate by the Department of Education, but they needed to confirm the rest through the feasibility study. Yeah. That's great. Um, and you mentioned that um, the life cycle for the electric school buses in New Brunswick is seven to 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason that, that, that and we know that most diesel buses have a, um, a life cycle of about 12 years. Is there a reason that that's the case in New Brunswick? Yeah. Um, again, really information that we talked to the department about. And at the time they said seven to 10 years is roughly when they start to look at replacing the buses. And generally buses do go as high as 12 years. Um, however, this, you know, they really do try to replace them at earlier than 10 years. Just for safety um, purposes is my, I guess in some ways an educated guess. Right. Um, but I don't think we have any other questions. Um, so we, oh, um, we have one more question. We've got time for it. Um, will the Conservation Council of New Brunswick push for retrofitting strategies of current diesel buses to convert them into electric school buses? We looked at that um, as part of our education in terms of building up our advocacy campaign. And right now with um, our legislation we're unable to retrofit any buses in new brunswick it's part of a safety requirement okay and i can i can jump in just to add to that i mean it, it is uh we yeah we looked in this issue of repowering buses right because the economics of it are good um but it is it is something uh that is sort of due to safety regulations isn't currently possible uh, so it's a whole nother kettle of fish, I think, uh, uh, really to, to you know, um, change safety regulations in particular. Um, so we've stuck to uh, the procurement of, of new buses. Okay. Thank you both. Um, so that's sort of the five minutes we had allocated for questions. There is, um, there may be other questions coming in, Elizabeth, into the questions um, tab. So you can have a look there and, and type any answers to subsequent questions. Um, and we will uh, move on to our second speaker. Um, so our second speaker today is Thomas Arneson McNeil. Um, Thomas is a policy researcher and musician from Winnipeg, Manitoba. He's passionate about electric vehicle policy, new mobility strategies, and playing old timey country music and, and bluegrass music. Prior to joining Ecology Action Center, Thomas worked for Densky Energy and Climate Advisors as an intern. He holds an, a Bachelor of Arts in History from Dalhousie and a Master's of Arts in Sustainable, Sustainable Energy Policy from Carleton University. So Thomas, I'll hand it over to you. Are you able to see the slides? I am, yeah. Perfect. Uh, so we'll see if I can... Uh... Oh, yeah, I'm able to move between them. Great. Uh, so I'm going to move quickly, uh, just with regard to time. I mean, a quick overview of uh, school buses in Nova Scotia. We have about 72,000 students per day that ride the school bus. Uh, we have about 1,300 uh, diesel school buses operating in Nova Scotia. Uh, so that's 23,000 tons of uh, CO2 emissions per year. Uh, and it's a bit of a, of a different situation in Nova Scotia. About two thirds of the buses here are owned and procured by the provincial government uh, and operated by the various school boards. Uh, and about one third are operated by a uh, student transportation uh, service provider. So something that's a similar situation in, uh, in Quebec, in Ontario. These are private companies that uh, run school bus services. Uh, and of course, transportation emissions in Nova Scotia are the second largest source of emissions. So, I mean, you know, try, it would make, a, I think, a significant dent um, if we were in those emissions, uh, if we were able to electrify school buses. Uh, but unfortunately, we have zero electric school buses on the road in Nova Scotia at the moment moment. Uh, so that, you know, puts us far behind, uh, kind of in line with Manitoba and Newfoundland, uh, unfortunately. Um, but I think a question that I get frequently, 
uh, is that, you know, how come Prince Edward Island is so far ahead with electrification? Um, and I think that's something that confounds a lot of uh, folks in Atlanta, Canada. Uh, and, and talking to, to people who are leading that transition in Prince Edward Island, you know, they're quick to mention they're the smallest province. Uh, you know, they have, let's say, the least financial capacity. Um, and so why is it that they've sort of been ahead uh, and we've been slower to adopt? Uh, and so that's a question and a problem that we're really trying to tackle. And I think it's really interesting and useful to look at what's been done in PEI and see, you know, what lessons can we learn in Nova Scotia? Uh, and so to that end, I mean, what's going on in PEI, uh, they're on track to electrify a quarter uh, of their school bus fleet this year. Uh, they will be electrifying the entire fleet uh, within the next decade. Uh, and they really have kind of a, a government um, plan to transition all school buses, uh, which are all owned by the government uh, in PEI, uh, to electric. So they, they really have policy direction, which I think is incredibly valuable. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that they've really used the federal money that's on the table uh, through the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. Uh, and I'll get into that uh, in a little bit as well. Um, you know, I think that ultimately, as I was mentioning, it, it, the PEI situation really reflects the need for long-term uh, government procurement strategies. Uh, that's something that we're starting to get in Nova Scotia. Um, you know, within the year, Nova Scotia will be releasing a government uh, greening fleet strategy, uh, so a long-term strategy to electrify all uh, government-owned vehicles. Uh, but that being said, it's providing that policy direction from the top. Um, that I think really gives folks the, the kind of direction that they need in order to start that transition. Uh, so in Nova Scotia, if we have a, a replacement rate of 100, elect, uh, 100 school buses a year, which we do, it's going to take about you know 13 years uh, to replace our entire fleet. So we're cognizant of that and cognizant of the fact that it's, you know, it's a progressive conservative government as well uh, in, in uh, Prince Edward Island. Um, and yet they've shown a lot of leadership on this issue. Um, and so I think it's, it's really looking for that strategy in particular from the government in Nova Scotia. Uh, I think that also, I mean, we can really learn from PEI in that uh, they really brought in the, the school bus drivers union there, uh, QP 1145, and sort of brought them into uh, advocacy on, on the ground floor and policymaking. Um, and I, I think that that's an incredibly effective strategy. We're facing a school bus driver shortage uh, throughout Atlanta, Canada right now. Um, and so we really need policies that I think are friendly to workers. Uh, They're going to make people, uh, you know, still want to be school bus drivers and, and anything I think that that gets in the way or disincentivizes people from taking a job as a school bus driver. is going to be a real problem out here. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, some of what PEI has done, I'll get into it in terms of uh, home charging pilots, uh, you know, has really been an interesting strategy that I think that we can learn from in Atlantic Canada. And of course, you know, workforce training and, and engaging uh, with first responders as well. Uh, and so, you know, the home charging pilot in PEI, this is really the only instance of this kind of policy that I've seen. Uh, what it entails is leasing a level two charger uh, to a driver on a rural route so that they can, uh, you know, bring their school bus home uh, as they are uh, accustomed to. Uh, and if you don't have such a model, then you have a situation which a driver would have to potentially get in their gas car, you know, drive to the depot at the school if they're working a split shift, potentially drive back home and then back again. Uh, and so it's really you can see the way in which it, it poses labor challenges um, and, and this, you know, opportunity of really leasing a, a level two charger to a driver um, and, and taking it out at such time that they no longer drive an electric school bus. Uh, you know, it not only is it more convenient for drivers, but based on our conversations with officials in PEI, really potential for significant cost savings there. It's, it's a lot cheaper to do home charging, um, I think, from what they've seen in their pilot than depot charging. Uh, and also, I mean, really significant potential uh, with vehicle to grid. Uh, this is a big issue in Atlantic Canada is trying to stabilize the grid, especially as we're having, you know, big storms uh, that routinely cause blackouts um, and brownouts in, in all the Atlantic Canadian provinces, really. Um, and so this capacity for vehicles to uh, heavy duty vehicles that are battery electric to discharge onto the grid uh, and act as a source of battery backup, I think is, is a really interesting and significant opportunity. 
Uh, and, you know, uh, they've been moving forward with that in PEI, basically using, they've already started using buses as battery backup, you know, in emergency situations. Um, and so I think it's important, and we've tried to highlight this to decision makers, you know, uh, this is really an opportunity to shore up the grid, I think, in a really interesting way uh, that can really help folks at a time when, uh, you know, you need power, which is an emergency situ situation. Uh, and so, I mean, another thing I think that's really worth mentioning uh, is that we need to design federal funding in such a way that it is accessible for private companies uh, trying to access that funding, that uh, it's accessible for provinces trying to access uh, federal funding. Uh, there's a lot of federal money on the table through the Zero Emissions Transit Fund that will cover up to half the deployment costs. Uh, but unfortunately, what we've seen is that uh, the Zero Emissions Transit Fund that is a dedicated source of federal funding uh, is quite difficult difficult to navigate uh, is quite onerous for both private companies and provinces that apply to that fund. So it's worth noting that PEI has, you know, they've stayed away from the zero emissions transit fund. Every single procurement that they've made has gone through the Investing in Canada infrastructure program. Uh, and it's a lot easier to access that funding. Um, but unfortunately, you're in a situation there where you have to choose between, uh, you know, making these investments in electric school buses and other investments that can green our school systems. Uh, so that, that's a choice that no one wants to have to make, and, and we need dedicated funding. Um, and, and so ultimately, I think the Zero Emissions Transit Fund, we've seen really long wait times on the contracted services side, uh, up to 18 months um, for, uh, for companies operating that operate in the Halifax Regional Center for Education. So those wait times are way too long. And ultimately, what we're saying to the federal government uh, is structure this as a, a rebate, ultimately uh, split it into two separate funding streams as it relates to the zero emissions transit fund and, and decrease the administrative delays that we're seeing. Uh, you know, additionally, I think uh, uh, what we've tried to really do uh, is play a role in connecting uh, jurisdictions that are farther ahead in terms of electrification. Um, so the Association of Student Transportation Services of BC, I mean, they're already operating a number of electric school buses. They've successfully applied to the Zero Emissions Transit Fund. And so we've done a lot of work to try and connect them and, and have these conversations uh, between those that have already uh, deployed electric school buses and folks working in, in these joint procurement agencies agencies that I mentioned uh, and in, in the Nova Scotia Department of Education that are responsible for buying these buses and also trying to facilitate, I mean, the operate, the, the sharing of operational data, uh, which I think is really valuable for uh, decision makers uh, and folks on the ground that are uh, looking to deploy these buses. Um, you know, what we're trying to do, I think, as well uh, in Nova Scotia is to facilitate pilot projects uh, by engaging and connecting utilities uh, with student transportation service providers and with school boards uh, to try and get some buses on the road. Uh, this is something that we've seen happen notably um, and very recently in Alberta and Saskatchewan, provinces that aren't necessarily friendly to electrification. Um, but, you know, there's an interest in the from the utility side in, in, in really, I think, uh, looking at the, the charging profiles of these buses and, and looking at technologies like vehicle to grid. Um, and so, you know, we're also trying to, I think, build really capacity amongst parents and uh, and students and teachers to to really call attention to the lack of deployment in Nova Scotia. Uh, I think these these public calls and, and engagement with parents is a really effective tool to put pressure uh, on decision makers. Um, we're in the process of organizing an electric school bus showcase to try and uh, get an electric school bus on the ground and, and really show people that this is a technology that works out here. Uh, and then, of course, uh, engaging with the provincial government um, to try and facilitate the release of their electric school bus um, greeting fleet strategy. Uh, so this is a that would be an approach that is modeled on PEI. Uh, and I think, you know, things to keep in mind uh, in Nova Scotia, maybe takeaways from the lack of deployment here. Uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in every single province as it relates to electric school bus deployment. I think that there's a lot of knowledge to be gained from looking at, uh, you know, other provinces that are farther ahead. Uh, I think utilizing the operational data that has been collected there, um, you know, talking to them and, and gathering information about best practices and, and you know, putting uh, officials in, in touch with the folks who are really on the ground deploying these buses, uh, you know, elsewhere, British Columbia, PEI, uh, now in New Brunswick, um, and, and, you know, trying to figure out what's best in terms of workforce training uh, as well. And I think, you know, in the case of Nova Scotia, it's important to remember that uh, the private companies that provide, you know, 
transportation services in Nova Scotia, they also operate elsewhere in Canada and have deployed electric school buses elsewhere in Canada. Um, and so we can leverage those companies in particular, um, because if they can deploy in Alberta, for example, why not Nova Scotia, right? If they can deploy in Quebec, uh, then then why not at the Acadian School Board? It's, it's the exact same company. Um, and so trying to really, I, th I think, you know, bring together those folks that have an interest in, in deployment um, and trying to push that situation forward. That's, uh, you know, part and parcel of the work we've been doing. Uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll thank you and I look forward to any questions. All right. That was a quick presentation. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, so while we're waiting to see if there are questions that come into the questions chat, um, I have a few. Um, do you know if PEI has seen any savings in operational expenses um, since they've been running the ESBs? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's one of the, I think, most interesting parts and, and maybe a thing that a lot of operators uh, and folks in charge of student transportation don't realize. Uh, once you take that federal money that's on the table uh, that covers, you know, half the capital cost of the electric school bus, these buses are way cheaper to own. And that's not that's not a sales pitch. I mean, this is borne out in um, data on the ground. Uh, that, that PEI has collected. Uh, and so what they've seen is that it costs about 25% of the cost uh, to operate an electric school bus versus a diesel school bus. Um, so, you know, once these buses start hitting the roads, I think there's there's enormous potential for cost savings, but it's, it's just really a, taking that first step, taking that money that's on the table and, and having a long-term strategy uh, that's gonna get you there. That's great, thank you so much. Um, and do you know how far along Nova Scotia is in the process of procuring ESPs? Yeah, so I mean, as Lizzie mentioned, uh, all Atlantic Canadian provinces have sort of banded together uh, through this organization uh, that jointly procures school buses. Um, in order to conduct, conduct a feasibility study that's Atlantic Canada wide uh, right now. And so they're in the process of conducting that study. Um, as Lizzie mentioned, it's gonna be completed by the fall and we're expecting really government procurement to ramp up, uh, not this year's procurement cycle, but uh, the procurement cycle in 2024. Uh, and there's a lot of benefits of procuring school buses that way. Right. Uh, if you have four provinces that are ready to come together and, and combine their purchasing power, uh, you can get a lower price point on those buses. Uh, you can get your you know, deliveries really prioritized by the, the companies that are producing those buses. Um, and so I think it's a, potentially it's a really beneficial situation. Unfortunately, what we've had thus far is uh, Prince Edward Island breaking away from that procurement group, uh, New Brunswick breaking away from that procurement group, doing these smaller, you know, 15 to 30 bus uh, procurements. Uh, it ends up being a lot more expensive. Um, so I think it's going to be really great if they're able to all go in together, ultimately. Uh, and we're really trying to put decision makers um, in Nova Scotia and at, at the Council of Atlantic Ministers of Education and Training in touch with those folks that have already applied for federal funding, um, like certain actors have in BC. Um, you know, so, so what's the best way to navigate uh, that federal funding process? What's the best way to ensure that you don't have the federal government come back to you and say, okay, we're going to fund, you know, 100 out of the 300 buses that you asked for. Um, so, you know, in, ensuring a, a successful application for federal funding, it might appear easy. It's not necessarily as easy as it sounds. And so we're trying to make sure that it, it really, you know, moves smoothly uh, and that we can facilitate what I think is going to be a, a really good situation <laughs> once it gets off the ground for, for buying electric school buses in Atlantic Canada. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Henry. Um, would Nova Scotia be able to convert its entire bus fleet to ESV or would long routes impede a total conversion because of ESV autonomy like in the case of New Brunswick? Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think that what the government of New Brunswick did initially, um, it was a really really helpful thing to do, which is say, okay, we're going to look at you know our school bus routes um, right now, uh, and, and we're going to look at the technology, uh, battery electric technology that exists, um, and we're, we're going to be able to say again, just off the top of our heads, without you know conducting a, a, a ton of feasibility analysis, is we probably aren't going to have problems with range uh, and winter conditions on about 60% of our routes, uh, and for the most part, those are 
routes that are a little bit more urban. You know, they're not the longest rural routes in the province, um, but that's where you can start, right? But that's a good place to start. Um, and so that's what we're saying in Nova Scotia is let's start on these, you know, routes that are a little bit more urban. And then as this technology advances, uh, move to routes, routes that are longer, that are more rural, uh, that are more difficult to uh, facilitate electric school bus deployment on. That's great. Thank you. All right. There's, uh, there aren't any other questions in the, in the chat, but um, there may be a few that pop up. So Thomas, if you want to keep your eye on that and, and uh, provide written answers, that would be great. And thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, so our third speaker today is Mark Saleh from um, Pollution Probe. Uh, Mark's a project advisor as part of the transportation team of Pollution Probe. And he has a strong background in sustainable mobility with a focus on electrical, electric vehicle adoption. He firmly believes that data-driven analysis powered by cutting edge software will play a pivotal role in the advancement of sustainable mobility and is actively developing tools that will support stakeholders in transitioning to sustainable transportation as part of the Mobility Futures Lab, a software-driven transportation consultancy firm. Mark completed his PhD at the University of Toronto, where he explored the role of emerging technologies in reducing transport sector emissions. Prior to pursuing his PhD, Mark received, Mark received a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Toronto. And I'll hand it over to Mark. Mark, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just, yeah, the slide deck is on, on large. Um, so my presentation today is going to be based on a report that we're going to be publishing this summer, which included, among other things, uh, developing a strategy to electrify school buses in Ontario. Uh, Pollution World Probe worked on this project uh, in partnership with the Delphi Consulting Group and Kipshi, and the work was funded by the Trottier Family Foundation. So just to start with some background on the number of school buses we have in Ontario. So we have around 20,000 school buses in Ontario. I think it's the biggest number across provinces. Uh, and looking at the composition of these buses, 67% of our buses are Type C buses. So these are the 70 seater bigger buses that people are most familiar with. And the rest are Type A sort of smaller school buses. And when we look at the age distribution of the fleet, 50% of the buses are between zero and five years old. And as was mentioned earlier, given that the average age of a bus before it's re retired is around 12 years, uh, we can already see that we're going to have at least 50% of our buses that are still, still going to be on the road within the next 10, 10 years. Uh, so the electric school bus transition is going to take time, and there are lessons learned from the few pilots that we have at this stage. Uh, so going into more detail into how the school bus industry is organized in Ontario, and Thomas touched on that a bit, so we have seven. Uh, 72 school boards in Ontario that are served by 34 student transportation boards. Now, whereas in some provinces, the school boards operate the buses themselves, in Ontario, the school boards only design the routes and then they contract a, fee, a private operator to run the routes themselves. And in Ontario, we have around 150 private fleet operators that are under contract to run 99% of the routes. And so these operators range from small operators with a couple of buses to larger operators with hundreds of buses. So in the process of designing our strategy, we came up with sort of four key areas of focus that are gonna touch on a lot of the points that were discussed in the previous presentations. So first we have pilot demonstration projects, policy development, funding commitments, and supportive resources. I'm going to briefly touch on each of those in the next few slides. So starting with pilots or demonstrations. Uh, so electric school buses are a new technology and it's going to require some sort of learning curve for the staff on the ground at the depots, uh, especially for deployments that are above five buses because the depot goes from being a place where the vehicles are parked to, be, for, to becoming a place for fueling or charging. And so there's some Staff on the ground need to learn how to manage this charging for it to do it the most the, in the most cost effective way. Uh, apart from from the charging issue, uh, pilots allow operators to learn more about the operational and maintenance cost of, of electric school buses. We discussed the operational side. So, an electric school bus 
the range of an electric school bus can vary by up to 40% depending on the driving conditions. And this is mainly due to the electrical heating system. So pilots would allow fleet operators to sort of take a look at that real world, world data and identify the routes that are eligible from the routes that are not eligible at this stage based on the battery sizes we have. Uh, then on the maintenance front, pilots would allow fleet operators to sort of validate the maintenance savings that have been advertised by, by vehicle manufacturers. Um, we have a, we added another point here about vehicle to grid. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but some pilots have been sort of taking the step further and testing vehicle to grid. The technology is ready and there's been a couple of pilots across multiple jurisdictions in North America. Uh, but the, the barrier is more on the regulatory side because each province has their own structure. So on the V2G front, the technology is there, but we're not at a point where an operator can sort of expect the revenue that would come from selling electricity back to the utility. It's still going to take some time. Uh, so now moving on to our second area of focus, which was policies. And so we segmented policies into sort of two sections. On one side, we looked at provincial policy, and this is incorporating ESB targets into provincial policies and programs or enacting policy to retire the oldest school buses and replace them by ESBs. There was a lot of discussion on that in the previous webinar on the experience of PEI and NBC. Uh, and then the second angle was looking at the specific contracts between the school boards and the fleet operators when they contract them. And so there we recommended to introduce some sort of clause that would ensure a portion of the fleet that is run by the operator is electric. And then as a second point, we recommended to increase the contract duration of these contracts, uh, the duration of these contracts to up to 10 years. So these contracts are typically five years uh, of a length of five years. And the reason why we recommended it to increase it to 10 years is because so the economics of a school bus entails paying higher upfront and then having operational savings throughout the lifetime of the vehicle. So after a certain number of years, the operator reaches sort of a break even point and it becomes cheaper to run an electric school bus. Of course, with provincial uh, with federal financial incentives at this point. Uh, so the idea was by increasing the contract length, we would allow operators to, to be sure that they're going to be running this bus for a sufficient amount of time to recoup the extra cost they paid for the electric school buses. And uh, so, so this was from the policy side. Now moving to funding, uh, as I just mentioned, so an electric school bus is cheaper than a diesel school bus as of today with the federal financial incentives. But without the federal financial incentives, it's still, there's still a gap to cover. And, but, given the amount of investments that have gone into the industry over the past few years, it is reasonable to expect that the cost of an electric school bus is going to be lower than a diesel bus within the next five to 10 years. Uh, with that, the, we recommended provincial funding in the meantime to allow fleets to start integrating electric school buses in their fleet and start training their staff to get used to the technology. Uh, so that was for funding. And then our last key area of focus was resources. Uh, so these would be resources to support the transition. Uh, from talking to a lot of fleet operators in Ontario and across the country, we found that a lot of them didn't really know where to start. So there is a need for some development guides and toolkits to support the transition. And in most most times it's just also to learn how to do the feasibility studies that are required by the zero emission transit fund. Uh, and apart from that, there's also a need, and this was mentioned earlier for training staff. So there's a lack of technicians and electricians that, that would be used at depots. And uh, there's a need to develop public, public education and awareness resources on the health benefits of ESBs. So in our report, we organized all our recommendations in a matrix of actions, uh, which includes a range of stakeholders. Uh, we included the government of Ontario, school boards, operators, utilities, and the nonprofit sector. So this is how the matrix of actions will look in the report. I'm not going to go over it in detail now, but it basically touches on a lot of the points I, I just talked about in my presentation. 
the main I, the key message here would be the transition to electric school buses is going to require coordinated action from a range of stakeholders in order for us to achieve a cost-effective transition. So that's it for me. Thank you. And I'm looking forward for any questions. Wonderful. Um, thanks so Mark. Uh, thanks so much, Mark, for your um, presentation. Um, I can ask a few questions to get us started while folks are, are uh, typing into the questions uh, menu. Um, so you mentioned that nearly 99% of school buses are operated by private firms on a contractual basis. Um, why is this the case in Ontario, do you think? Um, and is it advantageous or disadvantageous for the ESB transition? Uh, so why is it the case? I'm, I'm not really sure. I think at some point it became easier for school boards or cheaper to just run it this way. Uh, but now on the question on is it an advantage or a disadvantage, I think it makes things more complicated because you have smaller operators that don't have the capital to start piloting electric school buses. And then you have the bigger operators that have the capital to start the integration. And on top of that, there is an issue with the, with the routes because it's the, the school board that designs the routes and decide how long they are. And then the operator just gets the route and can change it. So in the case of electric school buses, at some point, we might end up in a situation where we would need to change the way the routes are done. And then if it's two different people, like if it's the school board that decides the operator doesn't really have a choice. And this is why we're getting pushback from the operators. Um, did the, the work that you did, um, were there any suggestions around alternatives as it relates to sort of the ownership model or does it just sort of, you know, base the recommendations on, on the sort of current status of ownership in Ontario? The current status, I, I think at this stage and across the country is just going to be focusing on the routes that are electrifiable and then waiting for, it's reasonable to expect that we're also going to get innovations and batteries that are going to improve. So at this stage, I don't think it's worth changing the way we design the routes and just start by electrifying the routes that are electrifiable. Great, thank you. Um, and what are some um, key data and learnings that you think would be important to collect at the pilot stage of an ESB uh, project? Uh, range, like the factors that affect range, uh, and, and we're actually doing that in Calgary. So we have a pilot and we installed a sensor on an electric school bus and, and it's still preliminary. We're going to be publishing that report at the end of the summer. Uh, but the key thing that is, was affecting range was the use of the electrical heating system. Uh, so if you use the heating system of the bus itself, you lose a lot of range in winter. So a lot of operators are just not using it at all, at all and installing a diesel heater. And that's becoming like best practice in, in Canada. Thank you. Um, you mentioned very briefly um, vehicle to grid application in Ontario. Um, do you have a sense as to whether that has um, you know, broad appeal in Ontario given the state of our electrical grid? I know Thomas mentioned that that was something that was of, of appeal in the Maritimes. Um, and do you have a sense as to what would be required to overcome some of the regulatory barriers? I, I, I haven't looked into it in detail, but just already in, in, in Ontario, our utilities are distributed and we have multiple like LDCs. So this already makes our situation way more complicated than other provinces where it's more concentrated. Uh, so, but we haven't, we've heard from a school board in Ontario, in Toronto, actually, that was considering a partnership to do a V2G pilot, but I don't know the details of who was, who's involved on that project. So they're, they're definitely looking into it, which is good. Thank you. Um, a couple questions from the chat. Um, does the fact that almost all of the school bus, um, well, school buses are operated by 150 private fleet operators constitute an obstacle to a full conversion to ESB or not necessarily as long as there can be funding to reduce the initial cost of electric school buses? Yeah, we, we touched on this question, but yeah, I think for the smaller operators that are running just a couple of buses, it's a bigger risk to take to try a new technology. 
uh, especially because of the yeah. But given if there's sufficient federal financial uh, federal financial incentives, then it should make sense because it's just cheaper for them. Yeah, makes sense. Um, there's a um, question from Donald. My understanding is that emissions, particularly toxic from diesel heaters, are potentially higher than those from a catalytic moderated diesel engine. Is that an issue that you are aware um, has been studied? We are looking into it and we actually propose a project. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent. So for a future webinar then. <laughs> um, there's another question. I'm not um, sure exactly what the question is, but um, so you mentioned that conventionally school buses, school boards were in charge of defining service blocks. Um, would that not be the case with ESBs as they need to perform in detail feasibility studies to make sure the energy requirement of the fleet, fleet is also satisfied? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so it's the school board that designs the routes and then the operator bids on the routes. Uh, now, if an operator wants to run electric school buses, they're just going to take from, let's say, the thousand routes that they get, they're going to pick the ones that they can run an electric school bus on but then it would be the operator's job. But then there's been a lot of pushback on this IDTF funding uh, because for public transit agencies, they design the routes, they run the routes, and the program is more catered to them. Whereas in the school bus industry, the operator needs to start working more with the school board, and this is where things start taking more time. All right, I think that's all the questions um, that are in the chat so far. Um, the other ones look like they're just comments, um, but you can have a look, Mark, in the in the chat, and there may be a few more that come up over the next little while. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so our final speaker today is Adam Thorne. Um, Adam is the director at Pembina, Pembina Institute's transportation program. He's been an assistant professor with the University of Toronto and the Toronto Metropolitan University since 2014, teaching public policy specializing in environmental policy. In the past, Adam has worked with the International Joint Commission to advance clean water policy in Ontario. Adam holds a doctorate from the Toronto Metropolitan University and a master's and bachelor's degree from Western University. Last but not least, I will hand it over to Adam. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much to my fellow panelists. This has been really interesting. I've learned a lot already, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so today what I'm gonna be presenting really um, is from a forthcoming report called Power Boost. This has been uh, written in conjunction with Green Economy Canada, uh, and of course supported by uh, a very generous uh, support by the Trot TA Family Foundation. Um, We've been working on this for about a year now, and it's a little bit early in terms of, of the process that we've been uh, engaging in here to advocate for ESVs in Ontario. Uh, but I wanna talk about um, how we're using a slightly different strategy here, given the reluctance, I'll say, of the provincial government uh, to engage fully when it comes to uh, electric vehicle supports. So um, one of the advantage, of course, is of going last is that lots of people have already covered some of this ground, so I can think I can move through this very quickly. I think uh, some of my fellow panelists have uh, illustrated quite nicely the advantages of ESVs. Um, uh, so I think it's needless to say, I can uh, just sort of summarize this by saying that ESVs, of course, are, are good for children and they're good for the environment. Um, ESBs in Ontario, again, I think Mark gave a really good overview of this. Uh, the thing I'll point out to you again is that 99% of school buses are operated by private firms. And of course, this introduces a significant amount of complexity into, uh, into uh, the process of introducing ESBs uh, into the province of Ontario. So what is our objective in this study and in this uh, 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 what we hope to do in terms of advocating to the to the provincial government? So Ontario has invested significantly in EV manufacturing, uh, very high profile investments like Stellantis, or at least I hope still Stellantis, uh, Volkswagen, uh, and other uh, many other uh, investments in manufacturing. What Ontario has not really done uh, is followed up with demand side policy. So whether at the uh, light duty vehicle or medium and heavy duty vehicle or school buses specifically, uh, they've not been willing to invest in purchasing uh, or uh, uh, purchase incentives or any sort of demand side policy. 
So really our goal with this report and the advocacy that we'll, we'll be doing around it is to advocate for demand side policies by showing the economic advantage of investing in buses. I think the advantage around, for example, uh, the health benefits have been clearly made and, and made quite well. And so what we hope to do is offer sort of a, a secondary argument here that not only will these benefit uh, children, uh, but of course they're gonna benefit manufacturing and the creation of jobs in the province of Ontario. So to provide a little bit of context for this, uh, Ontario's heavy duty truck manufacturing industry practically collapsed after the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and is really only operating at about 10% of its pre-production, uh, to, to uh, pre-2008 production levels. Uh, what's important to recognize here is that small and medium enterprises constitute more than 90% of the Ontario auto manufacturing sector. Uh, and because of this downturn, uh, have suffered uh, as a result. When we're talking about SMEs or small and medium enterprises, we're talking about organizations like uh, Ontario-based uh, TubeFab, which is uh, in Mississauga, employs 65 workers and produces metal and pipes for freight vehicles. So we're not just talking about the assembly of the actual vehicles here, but all of the way up the supply chain uh, when it comes to the manufacturing of, of school buses and, and more broadly, medium and heavy duty vehicles. So when we're talking about the benefits of, of ESBs, again, I think they've been laid out quite well in many of the, the presentations here. Just very briefly, I can summarize improved health outcomes, uh, reducing carbon pollution. We know these are good uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, to reduce uh, um, carbon uh, emissions in the province of Ontario and Canada generally. Uh, they can help improve energy security. We know electric vehicles are more efficient than uh, ICE vehicles or diesel vehicles, and this can help. Uh, 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 with energy security, and of course, reduce operating costs for fleet owners has uh, already been talked about. Uh, we know that that total, uh, total cost of operation uh, is at cost parity almost already in many cases. Uh, and I think this will be furthered by uh, new policies like the, the clean fuel regulation. What we've been really focusing on are the supply side benefits. Uh, this report will really sort of talk about the job benefits that come from investments in the electric school uh, bus industry in Ontario. And so for about every million dollar of plant investment, we've estimated about 20 new jobs will be created. Um, ESBs, uh, as this uh, um, industry takes off, um, we know the market in North America will benefit Canadian manufacturers who have a dominant market share of about 45% of the North American bus market. Uh, um, of course, that helps all the way up and down that supply chain. Again, it's not just those uh, manufacturers that actually assemble the vehicles. It's all of those uh, SMEs that supply the parts that create those vehicles. So, for example, if Ontario follows Quebec's target of 65% of ESBs in, uh, by 2030, which is a very ambitious target, our analysis shows that the direct, indirect and induced impacts of market growth in Ontario's ESB uh, sector could cumulatively result in approximately 10,000 new jobs and $1.5 billion in GDP by 2030. Um, I think it's really important to note here that when we're talking about this, we're not just talking about the number of jobs, which are obviously important, but it's also the quality of those jobs. You know, the um, collapse in, in 2008, of course, is really a long trajectory of the hollowing out of the manufacturing sector uh, in, in Ontario and, and Canada generally. A lot of uh, good paying jobs that are available to those who don't have post-secondary degrees uh, have fled the province and of course been replaced by service jobs that are often much lower paying uh, and don't have these types of security. So when we're talking about these types of jobs, we're talking about well-paying jobs uh, that typically have good job security uh, and of course are not only exclusive to individuals with higher, uh, higher degree uh, education degrees. Uh, so these are really desirable jobs and of course again we think that this uh, will help our argument in terms of supporting uh, uh, ESB, the rollout of the ESBs in Ontario. Um, so this is some example of some of the figures that, that will be coming out in the report. So for example, uh, um, 1.5, uh, um, uh, the use of uh, um, uh, economic benefits from the increased production sale and use of ESBs by 2030, again, based on that 65% of uptake, uh, would be approximately 10,000 jobs, $1.5 billion dollars. Uh, 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 in economic growth. Uh, and of course, that's not just the vehicles themselves, but that's also the charger uh, and the charger installation. So there, again, are benefits up and down the supply chain when it comes to uh, supporting these vehicles. 
uh, when we're talking about the vehicles, we're also, of course, talking about the assembly. So it's not just uh, um, uh, SMEs in the province of Ontario, uh, but we can think of uh, uh, jobs uh, throughout uh, Canada and, of course, uh, the U.S. as well. So what are the benefits to uh, SMEs themselves? And again, this is one of the real focuses of this report. Um, uh, we have uh, engaged in uh, significant research or Green Economy Canada has interviewed a number of different uh, SMEs to sort of recognize uh, that they have significant gains to be made here. Um, so for example, um, as we shift to ESVs, um, Canada has real advantages here when it comes to manufacturing ESVs. There are real advantages uh, in terms of our clean electricity, in terms of uh, uh, the opportunity for critical mi uh, uh, mining, again, up and down uh, of that supply chain. Um, there is the feeling that large OEMs uh, may not uh, uh, be able to enter some of these businesses, that is, may not be able to displace this SMEs, uh, really meaning that these, uh, there will be a long-term trajectory for these SMEs. Um, I think what the most important to summarize is that more than a dozen Ontario-based SMEs, too many acronyms, uh, were interviewed by Green uh, Energy Canada, ranging from critical mineral, mineral refinery companies, battery manufacturers, auto parts suppliers, manufacturers, charging infrastructure providers, um, and they all expect to see a three to four fold increase in business by, 230, uh, by 2030 due to increased ESB uptake. So again, to emphasize, this is not just good for the environment. It's not just good for children, although those are really important arguments to make as well. Uh, this is good for manufacturing in Ontario and it's good for Ontario's economy. So our report really uh, uh, summarizes a number of policy recommendations that we're making to the Ontario government, really based on this idea that, that in order to support this SMEs and those uh, assembly, uh, manufacturers of, of ESBs, uh, we need demand side policies, right? The best way to support manufacturing, of course, is to ensure uh, that those products that they're producing have customers to purchase them. So uh, going forward, we're arguing that Ontario should offer targeted and carefully designed grants directly to school districts for purchase of 500 S uh, ESBs by 2025 uh, for a cost of approximately $20 million, rising uh, uh, to 5,000 ESBs uh, by 2030, uh, again, about a billion dollars uh, in terms of that investment. To combat low operator awareness, uh, Ontario should support uh, and fund projects that help school bus drivers, operators, and managers to learn about the benefits uh, of ESVs. Uh, lots of research out there shows that many organizations, particularly, again, uh, um, smaller operators, aren't aware of the benefits and have difficulties uh, in gathering that information. Uh, um, so Ontario needs to support that. Uh, increase availability of ESB charging infrastructure. Ontario should quadruple its recently made commitment of $91 million, uh, $91 million spending on chargers to include at least five fast charging stations in each of the 72 school districts uh, by 2030. Again, a significant investment in charging infrastructure. And finally, Ontario should assist in training programs for Ontario and uh, ESB manufacturing operation and maintenance. We know the transition to zero emission vehicles is a skills transition. And so Ontario needs to support this transition, uh, uh, both for those who are manufacturing these vehicles, but of course, for those who obviously uh, have to uh, operate uh, and maintain those vehicles over time as well. One thing I'll take a, a moment to note as well, not sort of contained within the, the report that we will be uh, um, uh, forthcoming, but um, some of the work that we're doing around our federal recommendations uh, for a zero emission vehicle uh, strategy for the federal government. So very much uh, like uh, the federal government is considering a light duty vehicle uh, sales mandate currently, we are also advocating for a medium and heavy duty vehicle sales mandate moving forward. This mandate will be based on what we call beachhead strategy, something that was developed by CalStart and really recognizes that the medium and heavy duty vehicle sector is a really diverse sector. Um, certain vehicles, very much like buses, uh, particularly school buses, are ready for this transition today. Uh, lots of models are available. Uh, the way these buses are operated lend themselves to electrification. As we move up that sort of uh, weight class into medium uh, duty, particularly those used in urban delivery, uh, we know those vehicles are also relatively ready. Lots of models available. Um, they tend to operate on relatively short and predictable routes and return to barn at the end of the day. Uh, as, of course, we move up those heavy, uh, 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 those weight classes to the heaviest duty vehicles, again, we know that's where the most uncertainty is. And so our recommended sales targets 
uh, are really based on those different categories of vehicles with buses uh, being really the most aggressive set of recommendations we'll be recommending to the federal government that a sales mandate uh, should reach 100% of zero emission vehicle sales by 2030. And so the recommendations we're making to the provincial government really fit within, I think, this, this broader federal strategy uh, that we are uh, uh, proposing and advocating for. Um, buses are a great beachhead because, of course, uh, they allow for the development of learnings. Uh, um, uh, and that those learnings can then trickle up uh, to those other classes of vehicles and we'll see that play out as we move into the heavy duty vehicles. So what we're really hoping to do here is to capitalize on, on, on some of the work that's been done by many of the other organizations, including the ones who have been talking uh, here today uh, around the health benefits of ESBs and really combining that uh, with our research on uh, supporting ESBs is good for Ontario's manufacturing sector. And what we're really hoping is that this sort of uh, double argument that it's good for children and it's good for manufacturing and for Ontario's economy uh, can be one that, that the, the provincial government in Ontario will be far more receptive to. Uh, and we'll be working so to develop that over the next year. Thanks so much, everyone. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Adam. That was a really, really interesting presentation. Um, I'll start us off with, um, uh, with a question and then we'll see if there's a few more in the chat. Um, do you know, I mean, I know the report is yet to be released, but do you know if the Ontario government has been receptive to economic focused approaches and messaging um, or if that's, you know, still something to, um, to figure out as the report is released and, and you're doing some advocacy work around that? Uh, they've certainly been receptive to this argument in other sectors. So that is when it comes to, for example, LDVs. Uh, um, they've, they've invested quite heavily in, in light duty vehicle manufacturing, uh, as again, has been in the media quite recently. So uh, we're, we're somewhat optimistic that they'll be uh, more receptive to this argument. Uh, and again, I think it's that combination that makes it most effective. Hmm. That's great. Um, and you mentioned um, that this transition is also a skills transition. Um, does the report have specific recommendations um, to help ensure that this is part of a just transition in Ontario um, with consideration for Indigenous, Northern remote, low income communities to be involved in extraction, manufacturing, training and distribution? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, it doesn't specifically address that. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to sort of uh, drill down to that, that level. Uh, but it is work that the Pemin Institute is doing more broadly. We do have a program uh, within the Pemin Institute that is focusing on that sort of idea of a just transition. Uh, um, for example, working on um, gender equality when it comes to the zero emission vehicle transition. So uh, it's not necessarily specifically part of this report, but it is something that, that, that we are working on more broadly. And this question um, that's in the chat, it may be the same answer um, that you just gave, but did Pemina look um, into how the auto industry could source their mineral resources and batteries um, from responsible, sustainable mining practices? And if so, um, how would the supply chain look um, like from extraction outside of Ontario and assembly in Ontario? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, it, it, it was outside of the scope of this report, but it's certainly a really good question and something that I think that we, you know, when we're thinking about manufacturing of EVs in general, whether it's whether it's buses or, or light duty vehicles, these are questions that we're going to have to answer. It seems like the demand for critical minerals is going to be ramping up, uh, accelerating quite rapidly. Uh, and how do we make sure that we are accessing those minerals in a way that respects Indigenous rights, um, um, other environmental concerns like the protection of water, um, uh, international concerns, all of these will have to be addressed. I, I think the one sort of, I, I think, um, optimistic note, of course, is the possibility of, of recycling. Uh, we know that, you know, significant amounts of these materials can be recovered. And, and so, you know, as we are, are, are advocating for policies to adopt these vehicles, I think we need to also be advocating for policies to make sure that those materials are recovered. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in thinking about the, the sort of uh, shift and in industry readiness of SMEs in Ontario, um, do you think with investment from the government, this would require a pretty significant period of growth and transition? Or do you think there's still some latent um, capacity after the industry's collapse in 2008? 
That's a very good question. I think there is latent capacity. Um, you know, one of the wonderful things about SMEs is that they are tremendously adaptable. Uh, these are relatively small organizations that can recognize a change in the market, I think, much faster uh, than much larger organizations and, and, and can adapt to that. Uh, and I think many of them already have. Uh, there's probably others who can answer this question more effectively than, than I, but my guess is absolutely that's the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And was there lots of, you know, interest in and um, positive engagement from the SMEs that were involved in the report? Yeah, absolutely. So the interviews were conducted by uh, Green Economy Canada, uh, um, and I believe uh, uh, they've been really supportive of the report overall. Um, again, I, I think the argument that that Ontario pushing for the adoption of ESVs is really just going to create more of a market <laughs> for, for those vehicles and, and, and for the, the products that they're producing uh, is, a, is one that they can support, uh, I think, wholeheartedly. Hmm. Great. Thank you so much. There's, um, so there aren't any other questions that are popping up. Um, so with that, uh, and I don't have any more. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Adam. That was really, uh, yeah, it was a really interesting perspective on, on the transition here in Ontario. So I'm glad you're able to join us. Thank you. Um, so we have a few um, concluding remarks before we're off today, and we'll end a couple of minutes early. Um, so I want, you know, first to just extend our thanks to our speakers today for sharing about the work that they're doing to accelerate ESV adoption in their provinces. It was really interesting to learn about what was happening across Canada and um, to, to learn about some of the really interesting work and, um, and progress that you've been making over the last couple of years. Um, to conclude today's session, um, I want to encourage everybody to stay in touch with us by visiting our online resources library, um, which is at eSchoolBusAlliance.com. Um, .ca, join our bi-monthly newsletter and follow our organizations, Equiterre and Green Communities Canada on social media. Um, we'll be sending out a post-event appreciation survey along with the recording. So we'd really love uh, if you could provide your feedback uh, to help us improve future sessions. Um, and we have one final session of the conference, uh, Operating Electric School Buses from Coast to Coast, which is taking place June 8th, that's Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and we hope you can join us for this conversation with fleet operators across the country. So with that, I would like to say thank you to everybody who joined us today, and I hope you have a wonderful Tuesday. Thanks again to our speakers.